A very warm welcome to all of you, uh, and uh, thank you so much for giving your time uh, for uh, this important session. Uh, uh, we are here to uh, look at a series of webinars that we are planning over the year uh, to give you insights from our experiences as well as experiences from the market on what is very topical for all of us. Uh, transaction, uh, as you all know, is a very dynamic environment. Uh, there have been significant changes and there is a constant evolution process uh, that we all go through in the m and landscape. Uh, and the, the, the purpose of putting out this series is to help you navigate uh, this uh, the set of regulations and the ever-changing environment around m and uh, Some of it is coming through from our own experiences of having dealt with situations uh, on the ground uh, when we are doing a transaction. And some of it is coming from experience that we have uh, uh, garnered from market research uh, that we ourselves undertake. Uh, uh, great pleasure in welcoming all of you for this, uh, the first of the series of this webinars, which is focusing on corporate restructuring, particularly around group structure, rat rationalization, and business streamlining. Uh, we have had a fantastic uh, 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 interest coming up building into this session. We have almost 500 uh, plus uh, registrants, and we hope that the first series, uh, first of this series, sets out the uh, the agenda for us to follow over the next 11 months. Uh, we're keen to hear from you on feedback as well. So as we conclude, I'm sure we will have uh, your your views on how we have kind of looked at it. Our own uh, structure of how this presentation is planned is a lot of practical insights and case laws around what is happening in this field so that that keeps you interested. Uh, please feel free to reach out to all of us uh, for, uh, for specific advice uh, uh, around uh, structures or any questions that you may have around uh, this particular presentation. Uh, uh, Amit uh, Kumar is a chartered accountant. Uh, uh, between Amit and Suvira Agarwal, who is uh, a partner with us, uh, associate partner with us, uh, the combined experience is almost 40 plus years of uh, understanding of how tax uh, flows out in, uh, in business and operations. Uh, uh, Amit specializes particularly in advising clients on business and operation structures, and he's worked extensively uh, in inbound and outbound assignments across uh, locations for the firm. Uh, from a sector-specific uh, experience, uh, he has worked on diverse sectors such as technology, pharma, manufacturing, retail, hospitality and uh, of course hnis uh, from a from a per people perspective as well he's a regular speaker in several forums and uh, thank you amit for giving your time for uh, for this uh, important uh, series uh, that we are beginning today suvira needs no introduction uh, she's worked with several of you and she's a specialist in m and a succession planning, uh, trust structuring, and promoter rationalization. Uh, of course, she also focuses on cross-border transactions, both inbound and outbound, uh, and therefore comes with a lot of experience in kind of identifying what is uh, important for uh, us uh, from a transaction tax perspective. Uh, without much ado, I'd like to kind of uh, call upon uh, Amit to start the discussions and uh, happy listening and happy interactions, all of you. Look forward to contributions. Sure, Shida. Thank you very much. Uh, a warm welcome to all, all of the participants in our first session for this web series. 
as Sridhar mentioned, Suvira and I are going to take you through with some of our practical experiences on corporate restructuring. And uh, just a small announcement in terms of logistics, uh, we have kept a Q&A session towards the end of it. And therefore, feel free to ask us questions through the Q&A chat box. We would be taking up all this during the Q&A sessions. Uh, before we start the corporate restructuring, it is important for all of us to understand what is corporate restructuring. It is an act of reorganizing the ownership structure or operational structure of an enterprise for a better result in terms of efficiency, profitability, visibility, value enhancement, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is not a one-time exercise. This is an exercise which needs to be taken and undertaken on a recurring basis to necessitate the requirement of ever-ending challenging uh, the commercial environments in which we are working in, dynamic needs of an enterprises, and more importantly, exploit emerging opportunities, which on a daily basis we all come across. There are quite a few objectives which an enterprise or a company undertakes a corporate restructuring. And based on our experiences, we have put together and bucketed them into three. First, what comes is a financial sort of uh, objectives. We have seen quite a company or quite an enterprise take it as a, as a measure to reduce a cost and optimize their cost. Quite a few people look at it as a cash trap because in the multiple unit organization, the cash get trapped between the units and therefore getting a corporate restructuring help them in fungibility of the cash. Obviously, it leads to an incentive availability of the tax incentive and other incentives, what is there for the enterprises. And more importantly, the losses get streamlined across the group so that the loss making enterprises or unit, their losses can be set off against the profit making enterprises of the unit. Apart from the financial consideration, we have seen strategic consideration also. Sometimes it is for rationalizing the competitions or ring fencing the businesses from the risk profiling side of it, acquisition of additional capabilities, focusing on the management. And we have seen it becomes a very good tool for a value enhancement also, because sometimes by bringing two units into one, the value become increasing. And sometimes on a vice versa, when you break it and split that into multiple units, the value get increased. There are other reasons for which also the, the corporate structurings are being undertaken which are mostly on family settlement or expansion on diversification. And sometimes it is because of some other sort of measures, which is IBs, bailouts, takeovers, et cetera, et cetera. By and large, whether you have needs on one parameter or other parameter, it is important to understand it and then take it forward about what kind of corporate restructuring one can take it up. We have also uh, gone through the types of corporate structuring and depending upon the situations, a corporate structuring has to be undertaking. Like if you are getting into an inorganic or uh, acquisition, the typical part is a share purchase where you buy a company and then use it for some other purpose, or you get into an asset purchase mode whereby we offer slum sell or, or a demerge or an item I sale. Uh, the corporates take over the existing undertaking and use them for the purpose of their business. Structuring can also be achieved when a capital reorganization required to give an exit to existing shareholder or for that matter to give a compensation to the existing shareholder either by way of a capital deduction or a buyback. But what we are focusing in today's uh, session is more towards the entity reorganization and one part of it as towards the merger. In the subsequent slide, you will see we have come up with our thought process and some of the prominent area with regard to conversion of firm or LLP into a company, domestic mergers, and a cross-border mergers, both inbound and outbound. Before we get into the specifics of each of these type of it, it's important to understand what are the regulatory tax and regulatory framework around corporate restructuring. Mind it, what we have mentioned today is more with regard to tax and regulatory. There are other acts, other regulations, other laws, which also one needs to keep in mind when undertaking such kind of an assignments, more with regard to factory laws or labor laws, et cetera. When it comes to typical tax and fiscal laws from income tax perspective, but most important that the migration or structuring should not really lead to any additional tax, means the tax neutrality has to be kept in mind. 
Secondly, existing incentives and losses should not get lapsed in this process because if it getting less lapse, lapsed, then the efficiency what, what an enterprise would like to start will not actually come. Other part is on the Companies Act. There are set processes around it. Uh, we undertake under the proper scheme of arrangement between Section 230 and Section 234 of Companies Act. There are prescribed compliances, there are prescribed approvals from the regulators which needs to be opted. Moving further to SEBI, there are again compliances and disclosure requirement one needs to keep in mind when in case of a corporate structuring for a listed companies or where the listed companies are involved in, in, in actually that sense. Moving that to the exchange control regulation, wherever there is a foreign parties involved in terms of any of the party, a, a, a kind of corporate structuring, one should look at it, how the FDI, ODI regulation works, how the cross-border regulation works, et cetera, et cetera. Stamp duty, again, a very, very important point to be kept in mind because of two reasons. A, the entire process is all regulated through NCLT driven and therefore there is a stamp duty requirement of the of the order or the court order which you receive. And more importantly, if you have some real estate or, or any sort of a property out of it, there is a need for a stamp duty depending upon the local state laws. And last but not the least is indirect taxes. As I mentioned in income tax, all indirect taxes benefits should continue. There has to be fungible way of doing the GST credits. And in the course of that, if any sort of a specific approvals, et cetera, are required, from any sort of a authority like SEZ authority or EOU authorities, one need to undertake all of them so that the movement of that becomes fungible. In, in actually short, we need to keep all this thing in mind so that the basic purpose of any corporate restructuring can be met without uh, getting into any sort of a non-compliances or contravention from any side and at the same time achieving the benefit and the objective what we want to achieve. Uh, in the next part of the presentation, we are going to cover conversion of a partnership firm into a company, uh, which is covered both or which is provided both under the Income Tax Act as well as the Companies Act. In the Companies Act, under the Old Companies Act, as well as the New Companies Act, the concept is basically known as corporatization of the structure. So first, we will just try to understand or evaluate basically that what is the need that the business families are seeing for converting of their partnership firms into a company. The most important, I would say, is a fundraise. When a company wants to go or when a group wants to go for an IPO, or to do a strategic or and financial fundraise, basically, then a partnership structure is, is something which kind of uh, is not possible for a fundraise. And therefore, they think of converting the partnership structure into a company. Second biggest problem with a partnership structure is the unlimited liability of the company. This is something which is in the current environment, the business families are wanting to avoid and therefore they are corporatizing the structure. Next, I would say is growth and expansion. As the business grows, partnership uh, form of business is generally acceptable for smaller scale businesses. As business grows, the business families generally move to corporatize the structure. And lastly, but not the least, in case of a partnership firm or an LLP, a merger or a demerger kind of exercise cannot be taken up. And therefore, if you have multiple partnership firms which you want to consolidate, then the option left for you is to convert those partnership firms and then merge or demerge them so that you can create a one unit which can then go for an IPO or a fundraise. So these are the four main reasons which in our experience, which we have seen for which the uh, business families are moving towards corporatization of a partnership firm structure. Now, under the Companies Act, there is a specific section 4713, which lays down certain conditions which I need to comply with. Only then will the conversion of a partnership firm into a company be considered to be a tax neutral transaction. First of them is basically convert all the assets and liabilities of the firm become the assets and liabilities of the company. All partners of the firm become uh, shareholders of the company in the same proportion. 
the partners on conversion only receive the consideration in the form of shares. So cash or non-share consideration is not permitted. And lastly, and this is the most important condition, is that the partners hold 50% of the share capital of the resulting company, and they maintain this shareholding for a period of five years. This is the condition which generally businessmen find it difficult to comply with. Now, if I'm compliant with all these conditions, then the converting firm, on the converting firm, there is no tax implication. And similarly, the resulting company also, there is no tax implication. However, if I default on any one of these conditions, then the successor company would become liable to tax in the year in which the default has happened. Now, one difference I would like to highlight, highlight out here. So there is a set of provisions which provide for conversion of a firm, a partnership firm into a company. And there are a set of provisions which provide for conversion of a company into an LLP. Now, what happens is that if you see the language of the sections, in case of a partnership firm converting into a company, it says capital gain on transfer of capital assets or intangible assets of the firm to the company. So the exemption is only for the firm. It does not talk about the partners. Whereas in case of 4713B, which talks about conversion of company into an LLP, it not only talks about transfer of capital assets and intangible assets of a company to the LLP, it also talks about transfer of shares held by the shareholders of the company and in exchange they get the, uh, the LLP interest. So the exemption is both in the hands of the company as well as the shareholders. But in the case of a partnership firm, the exemption provided in the law is only in the case of a partnership firm. And therefore the question arises that when I'm converting a partnership firm into a company, what would be my cost of acquisition or what would be the period of holding of the shares which are getting issued to the partners on conversion? Secondly, you know, there are various case laws which talk about that even if you are not compliant with these conditions, then also when you are converting a partnership firm into a company, it is basically a legal vesting. And therefore, it should be a tax neutral transaction per se. And one of the arguments which is given is that the consideration is not determinable. Now that is a bit of a dangerous field to get into because the moment you say that the consideration is not determinable, then 50D of the Income Tax Act triggers where you may be, the assessing officer will get the right to determine the consideration for the transaction. And lastly, the stamp duty implications on the conversion. Now, again, if I say this is a legal vesting, it's a conversion by law, that means there should be no stamp duty because there is no transfer. And there are favorable case laws on this principle. So uh, now I'm going to take up two case studies. The first case, case study basically is that a partnership firm was converted into a company. And then the, uh, the, uh, the promoters wanted to merge company A into company B. So company A is the resulting company post conversion. And then company A was proposed to be merged into company B. The important point to note out here is that the partners of the partnership firm and the shareholders of the resulting company are the same. So if this is happening, and this was, this was happening within, five, within the period of five years of conversion. So that means I am not compliant with the last condition of 4713 that the shareholding has to be maintained for five years. So here now the argument begins is basically when I'm merging company A into company B, does the original exemption which I had got on the conversion of the partnership firm to company A, has that been lost? There is this judgment or there is this AR ruling and followed by the Bombay High Court judgment in the case of Umicore Finance, which says that the value of company A 
and the resulting company is the same. So practically there is no transfer. And if there is no transfer in the first instance, meaning that there was no capital gain event in the first instance when the conversion happened, therefore, then the requirement of meeting those conditions under 4713 does not arise. And therefore the merger of company A into company B should not be a problem. The other argument which we have seen in our experience, which people take is, as I had highlighted, that the partners of company A and the shareholders of company B are same. So even if I'm merging company A into company B, the resulting partners are the same set of individuals. So that means those partners who had to continue to be partners or shareholders of company A for five years actually continue to stay as shareholders of company B for five years. So indirectly that condition is being met. Now, Umicore just talks about taxability on the partnership form. In the next case study, we will talk about taxability in the hands of the partners as well, on which the AR in the case of the Domino's printing matter had taken a position. And the historical position of vesting, of course, which was taken by the Bombay High Court in the case of Texpin is still being relied by the various AR uh, in the various AR rulings. Another important aspect to be considered out here is that when I'm merging company A into company B and say company A has accumulated losses. So are those losses continuing to be available to company B? Now, if you do a fine reading of 72A subsection six, it says a conversion which is compliant with 4730. So what we are facing a problem out here is not only of capital gain being levied on the merger of company A and into company B, if we take that position. The second question which comes up, if, if there are losses in company A and I am not meeting the conditions of 14.7.13, are my losses getting lapsed? So, okay, I have raised a lot of questions. What is the solution to it? One solution which can be thought of, I'm not saying it's a foolproof solution and we have to also be conscious of GAR being invoked, is that if instead of merging company A into company B, if I do a demerger from company A into company B, am I ending up avoiding the entire debate around questioning of 4713 compliance? Because company A is continuing, and therefore company A will continue to meet the conditions. And it's only a business which is moving from company A to company B. And there is no restriction in 4713, which requires me to continue that business for a X number of period. So this is the thought I would leave, like to leave it with you that instead of a merger, if I do a demerger as a consolidation exercise, do I get the best of both the worlds? Let's move to the next case study. In this case study, what had happened is that company B was the acquirer and they were wanting to acquire the partnership firm, which is company A. And they were wanting to acquire 53% stake. So again, the same problem. I converted the partnership firm into a company and therefore I had to meet the five-year condition and the 50% condition but company B wants to acquire 53%. So if company B wants to acquire 53%, I'm breaching the 4713 conditions. And on top of it, as I mentioned, 4713 does not provide tax neutrality to the partners. So then what happens when the partners are going to divest 53% stake in favor of the company B, if this transaction becomes fully taxable, then what would be the cost of acquisition? What would be the period of holding? Will I, will I count the period of holding from the day when the partners became partners in the partnership firm? Will the entire original capital which they contributed to the firm be considered to be the cost of acquisition of the shares? And what could be the solution in this scenario? So the solution which comes to our mind is that if I make company B 
as the shareholder of the partnership before conversion. Say I make them a 2% shareholder of the partnership firm and then convert the partnership firm into the company. Therefore, now that 50% condition which I have to meet will be inclusive of the partnership interest which company B holds in company A. And I will be able to meet the condition of 4730. Sure, Suvira, thank you. Uh, when it comes to merger side of it, and we have kept it few slides and few experience from our side in terms of the domestic mergers, what we are talking about. But before that, let's go about what are the different types of merger we generally see uh, across organizations? First of all, it's very simple that two, uh, two company are a parallel company and you see uh, in, in this diagram company A merging into company B. We call company A as an amalgamating company or a merging company and company B a kind of calls as a com uh, this amalgamated company or maybe the surviving entity. As a part of that, company B needs to issue the shares to the shareholder of company A to complete the compliances of a merger. Similarly, in a, in a, in a kind of serial work, you have seen or we have seen subsidiary company getting merged into holding company. In actually course of that, there is no shares to be issued because holding company cannot issue the shares to their own. And similarly, we have seen a reverse merger situation where holding company get collapsed into the subsidiary company. In any one of them, what are the key consideration is A, how do we achieve this restructuring through a tax neutrality? Because if organization end up paying taxes on this, it becomes very, very difficult to take it up. Secondly, what, what will happen to the merging companies, which is company A in our example, and their losses and ends of depreciation, do they get carry forward along with the merger? B, similarly, what will happen to the existing loss of the, of the surviving company, which is company B in our example, whether they will be able to get it. Other question which hovers around it, the MAT credits and permissibility of the exchange control regulations. A due care has to be given to particularly the losses in case we deal with the company which are having the losses because those cases require a separate consideration and a separate thinking process. Now, when it comes to the losses part of it, there are two most important sections in the Income Tax Act, which one needs to keep in mind. The first section comes, section 72, and it covers various scenarios under which the losses has to be kept in mind. It starts with carving out certain sector where the exceptions are available in terms of carry forward of losses and depreciation. If you are an industrial undertaking or you are a banking company or a private sector company under similar scenario, then only the merging entities or the amalgamating entities are allowed to get carry forward their losses and depreciation. In case the merging entity are not of any of this under, industrial undertaking or the banking or those sector which is mentioned, in those cases, the carry forward of the losses are not allowed and they get lapsed during the course of the merger process. We have put together a certain case study with regard to industrial undertaking and therefore it is important for all of us to understand what are industrial undertaking. It is, has been given a very specific definition under section 72A that industrial undertaking means an undertaking which is engaged in the manufacturing of process goods, computer software manufacturing, business for generation and distribution of electricity or any other form of power, businesses of providing telecommunication services, mining or construction of ships, aircrafts and rail system. That means if you or your enterprise is engaged in one of these activities, you fall under the industrial undertaking. And if they are not in that, technically you do not fall under the definition of industrial undertaking. And therefore, if those kind of entities get merged in the course of a merger, their losses or their depreciation get lapsed. Second point, very important point is, even though an enterprise falls under the definition of industrial undertaking, there are certain conditions stipulated both to be met by the merging entity as well as by the surviving entity. These conditions are 
that the company, the merging entity, should be engaged in their business for more than three years in that particular industrial undertaking which is proposed to get merged. Secondly, at least 75% of the book value of the asset continuously held by the merging entity two years prior to the date of merger or date of amalgamation. This is basically to avoid any sort of a tax planning if company wants to undertake where they set up something and then want to merge it off with something else. Idea was basically to take care of all the genuine cases where the companies are struggling to carry on their industrial undertaking due to any sort of a pressure for cash or any other reasons. Similarly, there are condition which has been given for the surviving company or amalgamated company that whatever they take as an asset from the merging company, they should continue at least 75% of the book value of the fixed assets over a period of minimum five years. Secondly, they should continue the business for five years. It should not that the, the resulting company or the surviving company takes the, uh, the business and shut down that business. And last, again, an important condition which has come as a part of a rule that at least 50% of the uh, installed capacity should be reinstated before the end of four years and continue to the five, kind of to the fifth year as well. There's a small compliance requirement is there that there is a form 62, which has to be verified by an accountant and needs to be filed along with the return of income. By and large, if you do not fall within these definitions, you will not be able to carry forward the losses or the unabsorbed depreciation under section 72A of the merging entity. Another important section, section 79, to be kept in mind when it comes to dealing with losses in a normal scenario of a corporate restructuring or a domestic merger. Now, section 79 is a section which is applicable to in any scenario. It need not be only tested in case of a corporate restructuring. It covers any company which is not a privately held company, that is a closely held company. And where there is a change of shareholding happening beyond 49%. That means the law say that between the year of loss and the year in which this kind of a shareholder structuring takes place, if there is a same shareholding of 51%, or you call it as a common shareholding of 51%, having voting right, then companies are allowed to carry forward their losses. If there is a change beyond 51%, which is like change beyond 49%, in that case, the losses will get lapsed. Now, this is a section which has actually created a thought process to many of us whenever there is a change of shareholding happens. And few of these scenarios, we have kept it in the subsequent slides. But there are some good news around it that there are exceptions or special provisions which has been given for the startups and startup who are actually taken a startup registration, which prescribed under the law. In those cases, this, there is a relaxation that even though the founder shares or founder shareholders composition of shares falls below 51% also, they will be allowed to carry forward the losses, provided that these losses are incurred for the first seven years. And more importantly, that the shareholder or the founder member continue to have those shares with them. There is no event part exit on that. Uh, there are questions around it and we will try to cover that. There are certain exceptions given and these are most of the exceptions where because of some other force, there is a need for change of shareholdings. And those exceptions are when there is a death of shareholder or where there's a gift uh, by the shareholder to any of his relatives or a resolution plan under the IBC code. In those kind of a scenario, there is a external force for the change of shareholding, and therefore those will not be seen for the purpose of section 79. Similarly, there are other scenario which has been given as an exception where due to any overseas merger, amalgamation, or any structuring, there is a change of shareholding of the Indian company. And after the amalgamation, 51% of shareholder post restructuring continues to be the shareholder of the Indian entity. Then again, section 79 does not apply. 
Similarly, whenever there is an NCLT order under which there is a suspension of board of directors or some sort of a change in shareholding under section 242, which is more of a kind of misrepresentation, et cetera. In those kind of a scenario also, section 79 does not apply. Last budget, there was another regulation which has brought in that in case of during the previous year, if there is any change and there is a relocation of an offshore fund into the gift city or IFSC AIF, in those kind of a scenario also section 79 does not apply. By and large, these are the two sections which one needs to keep in mind when it comes to dealing with unabsorbed depreciation and brought forward losses. Now, there are a few common questions which we come across during the course of any discussion with any company or any organization which wants to take the corporate restructuring. And few of them we have just highlighted in this slides. I'll just read few of them which are very, very important. And we have kept some case studies based on our experience in the subsequent slide. Number one is what will happen to the losses if an undertaking or if a, a merging company meets all the condition what we spoke under section 72A. Those losses, whether they get a fresh life for eight years, how those losses would be treated in the hands of the merged entity or the amalgamated entity. Second is what will happen to the accumulated capital loss because you need not have only business losses on an absorbed depreciation. The company may have other sort of losses including capital losses, what will happen to them? Other things is, is there any altered methods we have when a particular transaction is not meeting the condition of section 72A, which is an industrial undertaking, et cetera, how to undertake the transaction in those scenarios. Fourth, we just saw definition of industrial undertaking. Service industry, very limited, it has been kept there. What will happen to other service industry? whether there is a possibility to call that they also form part of in industrial undertaking. Section 79, which we just spoke about uh, losses which will get lapsed, does this apply to depreciation or not? How does the interplay of section 72 and 79 happens in a typical corporate structuring? And last but not the least are registered owner versus beneficial owner. Now we have kept few of the case studies around it and I'll just take a few of them uh, during the course of our discussion. Now this case study, uh, there is a company A, which is a merging entity. It has an undertaking, which is an industrial undertaking and that has a loss. It meets all the criteria for the purpose of going ahead with taking as a tax neutral uh, a kind of merger. There is a company B, which is a profit-making company, a profit-making undertaking it has. There's another company C, uh, which has undertaking, a loss undertaking, but these losses are more of a capital losses. In the same year of this merger or this corporate restructuring, company B wants to undertake certain slum sale of their existing undertakings and they are anticipating certain profit coming out of that slum sale, which is typically to be considered as a capital gain. Objective of this transaction is to create a structure where the losses which are coming from company A or company C as a part of the structuring can be offsetted against a profit which company B is going to generate out of the transfer of undertaking to company D through a slum sale. Now, if we see one by one, all the scenario, first I'll take the transaction of company A and company B. Since company A is an industrial undertaking and it meets all the criteria as we discussed in the 72A, the losses for company A will be allowed to be carried forward, both the losses and depreciation to company B. Now there's a circular, circular number 229, which specifies that such losses will be treated as a current year loss of company B, which is a merged entity, and it gets a fresh life of eight years. Now, as we know that if there is a current year loss, that loss can be set off against any other head of income, including capital gain. And therefore, any capital gain company B earns out of the slum sale of undertaking two, that particular will be available to get set off against the losses. 
when it comes to the transaction between company C and company B, section 72A talks about business losses and unabsorbed depreciation to be carried forward in case all the conditions are met. It is silent on capital losses. And therefore the view emerges out of it is a capital loss cannot get transferred or carry forward as a part of merger and it get lapsed. It is affirmed by various, judici uh, various judicial precedent, including Mumbai Tribunal judgment in case of planet chemicals. And this is more of a settled positions which everyone keep in mind whenever there's a capital loss. Now there are alternate way of dealing that as well, where depending upon the scenario and the requirement, you can think of a asset transfer or a slum sale between company C and company B where a profit can be offsetted in the hands of company C itself against this capital losses and company B gets a fair market value driven exercise and can claim depreciation on such assets or such businesses what they are going to get from company C. Now these are fact specific because there is a consideration requirement to be paid by B to C. There are requirement in actually terms of uh, the, the shareholding pattern, et cetera, which needs to be met. If you come to the next case study, uh, this is where a company A has various type of business activity. In this example, you have taken as a hospital or a healthcare segment. They have an investment segment. They may have a hospitality segment. And these company A has losses, business losses and unabsorbed depreciation. On the other hand, company B, you have a manufacturing business and there is a proposal for merging company A into company B and thereby utilizing the losses. Now, as we discuss that company A being a merging entity needs to be an industrial undertaking. An industrial undertaking is defined very strictly in section 72A, which does not include an hospital business or a healthcare business or an investment business, et cetera. And therefore, a simple merger of company A to company B will not solve the problem because the losses will not allow to be carried forward. This is affirmed by actually Madras High Court in case of Apollo hospitals as well, where the court has straight away says that industrial undertaking definition has to be read in a very, very restrictive manner. And such kind of a transaction will not qualify for that. Again, as an alternate way, one can look of a demerger scenario here where one of the business units can be demerged from company A to company B and section 72A talks about a scenario when there is a demerger happening, losses related to that particular demerged undertaking and the undertaking which is moving, those losses can be carried forward from company A to company B. So one can evaluate that as a part of an option. Now this case study, uh, it's a very important case study because it gives an interplay for both section 72A and section 79. Let me first put together the thoughts. These are two uh, a kind of parallel company. Company A, which has a shareholder 100%. Company B, which has its own shareholder 100%. Both the company are into losses and they are having both business losses and unabsorbed depreciation. Under the scheme of arrangement, post-merger, the scenario being envisaged that of the merged entity, the shareholder of company A is going to have 51% and the shareholder of company B will have 49%. Now, in this scenario, there are two, three things comes up because both sides, there is a loss situation. You have a loss in company A and company B. And section 72A, which contains a non-abstinent clause, which says that it overrides any other provision of the act and therefore section 79 state away get uh, overridden. And in that case, the positions and which is a correct way of looking at it is that any loss, if they meets all the criteria of industrial undertaking and all other, all other conditions, then the losses of the merging entity or amalgamating entity will get carried forward to the amalgamated company or the merged company. Secondly, the merged company, which is maybe a company B or a company A, depending upon scenario, whether you merge company A into company B or B into A, the existing entity is 
where section 79 condition has to be met and there to carry forward its own losses which they have incurred in the past that you need to meet section 79 that means 51 percent of the shareholding need to remain constant now keeping this two section in mind if we take a scenario where company a is getting merged into company b and company b is actually the surviving entity the business losses and unabsorbed depreciation of company A will simply get transferred and carried over to the merged entity, which is company B, because of section 72A. However, the losses for company B will not be allowed to carry forward because their shareholding has been reduced beyond 51%, it becomes 49%. Therefore, if you merge A into B, there is a strong possibility that the business loss of company B will get lapsed. However, if you do a reverse way, where if you merge company B into company A, in that case, the losses and unabsorbed depreciation of company B comes to company A by way of section 72A. And section 79 condition is also being met at company A level, which is a merge entity because 51% shareholdings remain here. So the proof of, or the plan of action or the planning what can be done is, instead of merging A into B, if you merge B into A, you are able to take care of the entire losses here. One point I want to add it here that section 79 only talks about business losses. Therefore, an unabsorbed depreciation will be allowed to carry forward even though there is a change of shareholding happening beyond section 79. An important planning which one needs to take it, but this we are talking about only from a tax perspective. There are certain other business criteria as well as other legal provisions. One has to look at it before taking a call whether A to much to B or B should get much into A. The next important point which I would like to cover here is section 79 dichotomy. Now section 79, as I mentioned, it mentioned about a common shareholding the, between the shareholder uh, who is having a voting right and beneficially own the shares. Now, if you see that the section, the section talks about the shareholders having voting right and who owns beneficially. And there it comes that two school of thoughts have emerged over a period of time that in a linear structure where assuming there's an Indian company on below, and you have shareholders by way of an intermediary company and on top there are shareholders on that in a three-tier structure or two-tier structure. Whether when we talk about ownership or shareholder having voting right, whether we should take it as a registered owner, which is a direct shareholder of the underlying Indian company, or whether we go to the ultimate uh, kind of beneficial owner, UBO, what we call it, and then you have to test the section 79 applicability. Now there are two school of thoughts and most of them have their judgment in their favor. And therefore there's a complete dichotomy. First school of thought says it should be going with a registered owner. What one has to look at is the legal ownership and ordinarily and by default, Registered shareholder should be considered as a beneficial shareholder until and unless a registered shareholder holds the shares on behalf of their shareholder or their holding companies. And therefore, in case of a change of a registered shareholder, Section 79 get invoked and the losses may get lapsed. This particular school of thoughts get blessings from various judgment, including Delhi High Court judgment of 2016, pretty recent, where the courts have blessed this and say that until and unless there is a need, we should not leave the corporate wheel. It has to be seen as a registered company holder, registered shareholder. As against that, we have judgments which supports a beneficial ownership and there they say that uh, a, a company does not have any right to participate in anything. Ultimately, they work under the control and the wisdom of shareholder itself. And therefore, the beneficial owner should be the actual shareholder who beneficially own. And in a multiple tier structure, if the ultimate uh, shareholders remain the same or ultimate holding company remain the same, then 
interchange of the structuring between the group companies should not impact section 79. And this gets the blessing of, of AMCO power system of actually Karnataka High Court of 2015. Now, if you read this judgment, neither of the judgment refer them each other. That means when Yum restaurant happened in 2016, it has not referred 2015 AMCO judgment. And some of these judgments, which are lower part of the deck, they also have not referred and analyzed the other, a kind of other side of it. That means as a taxpayer, we are completely in a in in a kind of a situations where both the options and both the school of thoughts may be relevant today we have seen cases where there is a prolonged litigation coming because of both the approach as you can see in this case study if there is a structure of fco1 which is on top you have an intermediary company fco3 which in turn hold indian company ico which is a business losses and ends of depreciation if there is a change of shareholding happening between FCO1 and FCO2, uh, where actually there is a sale of shares happen at overseas level, if we apply approach one, which is registered owner, then loss will be eligible because between ICO and FCO3, which is a direct shareholder or registered shareholder, there is no change and therefore losses will be allowed to be carried forward. However, if we apply the approach to of beneficial ownership, there is a clear change of beneficial ownership between FCO1 and FCO2, and therefore losses shall lapse. Now, depending upon the scenario, the tax authority will also play their part of it and they say, okay, the other view is applicable, or the taxpayer also see the other view as applicable. But today, the scenario is that this is an unanswered way. And uh, in the times to come, we are expecting some sort of clarification either by making amendment in the act or by having some jurisprudence in this front. As we speak today, there is a dichotomy on a registered owner concept versus beneficial owner concept. So uh, next segment, we'll talk about cross-border structuring. So pro as far as cross-border transactions is covered, there are relevant provisions in the Companies Act under section 234A, or the 25A under the rules, rule 25A. And then there are cross-border regulations which have been issued by the RBI as well. As far as the RBI is concerned, if we are, con if we are compliant with all the conditions which have been given in the cross-border regulations, then it is considered to be a deemed approval from the RBI. Now, there are two kinds of cross-border transactions which we talk about, an inbound merger or an inbound transaction or an outbound transaction. So in an inbound transaction, it is basically a foreign entity merging or demerging into an Indian entity. And an outbound transaction is when an Indian entity is merging or demerging into a foreign entity. As far as inbound transactions is concerned, there is no restriction prescribed under the law as to companies of which country can merge or demerge into in an Indian entity. Whereas in case of an outbound transaction under rule 25A, there is a list prescribed or there are conditions prescribed that I have to comply the, the, the jurisdiction to which the transferer entity belongs to has to comply with a certain set of conditions. And then only the companies of that jurisdiction will be allowed to merge with India, with an Indian company. Some of the examples which we have seen is Mauritius allows merger both ways. Singapore allows an inbound transaction, does not allow an outbound merger. UAE depends upon the free trade zone where your company is located. So each country has its own regulations as far as cross-border transactions are concerned. For example, if you take the EU countries, they generally allow mergers, demergers between EU countries. They do not allow merger, demerger outside the EU countries. Then there is also a dichotomy between a merger and a demerger. Are both allowed? Now, if you see the company law provisions, they only talk about amalgamation or a merger. They say merger or scheme of amalgamation, both under section 234A as well as 25A. But if you see the RBI guidelines, they also talk about a scheme of arrangement. 
and a scheme of arrangement would cover a demerger. Even the NCLT looks to be confused. The same bench, the Ahmedabad bench of NCLT allowed an inbound demerger but disallowed an outbound demerger for the same group, the Sun Pharma group. So same NCLT taking a different view on a merger, on a, sorry, on a demerger inbound and a demerger outbound. Let's move. Now these are, this is a comparative of the guidelines which the RBI has provided for an inbound merger and an outbound merger. In case of an inbound merger, foreign company merging into an Indian entity, the Indian entity would issue shares and therefore it has th this issue of shares has to be compliant with the FDI regulations. Whereas in case of an outbound merger, the issue of shares by the foreign entity to the shareholders of the Indian entity has to be compliant with the ODI regulations. And if the shareholders are individuals, then it has to be compliant with the LRS scheme. The valuation for the transaction has to be done by valuers who are registered with the professional body in the jurisdiction of the transferee entity. And the valuation has to be done as per the internationally accepted principles of accounting and valuation. So the, the transferer entity may have an office either in India or the overseas country. So in case of an inbound merger, if the transferer, that is the overseas entity has an office, say in Mauritius, that office will become a branch office for India. And similarly, in case of an outbound merger, the office of the Indian entity would become a branch office for the foreign entity. If there are any guarantees, borrowings, any lendings, basically, then in case of an inbound merger, these borrowings or lendings, which become borrowing or lendings of the Indian entity have to be compliant with the ECB regulations, the borrowing and lending regulations, the guarantee regulations. Now, should they not be compliant with these regulations, then RBI is providing you a period of two years to become compliant. But in the period of this two years, you cannot make any repayment of these borrowings. In case of an outbound transaction in the scheme, you have to make a commitment that the company, the resulting company will pay off all the borrowings or the lendings of the Indian entity. And uh, yeah, so they, and further the Indian, the, the, the parties from whom the loan has been raised have to give their no objection certificate to the scheme. Now, in case of a merger or a demerger, the resulting company will end up holding assets of the overseas entity or vice versa in the case of an outbound merger. So this is permitted. Further, if there are any liabilities, which technically as per the FEMA regulations, you should not be holding. So these assets which the Indian entity acquires in an overseas jurisdiction can be sold off and the funds generated out of this divestment of assets can be used to pay off the borrowings. And a similar is the situation, but a reverse situation is there and permitted under the outbound merger as well. So this is a case study wherein ICO is a listed entity. The ICO had a Cyprus entity under it, a 100% subsidiary, and the Cyprus entity in turn had a Romanian entity. Now, this structure had been created with the intent of setting up business in Romania, but things didn't move as the promoters have, would have wanted it to move. And therefore, the Romanian business did not flourish. And therefore, the client wanted to wrap up the business because they were incurring fixed cost maintaining the Cyprus and the Romanian entity, which was no longer required. Now, both Cyprus and Romania are EU countries. And therefore, a direct merger of Cyprus or Romania into India was not permitted. The other option which was available to the company was that Cyprus could have been liquidated. But if you would liquidate Cyprus, that means shares of the Romanian entity would be received by the ICO in India, which would have tax implications uh, under Section 46. Further, since it's shares of a foreign company coming into the hands of the Indian entity, there could be 56 implications as well. So an alternate path was adopted. Cyprus was re-domiciled to Mauritius. And I just mentioned that Cy Mauritius allows a cross-border merger. Uh, 
So first Cyprus got redomiciled to Mauritius and then Mauritius was merged into India. As a result, the ICO presently is directly holding the Romanian entity. Now in Cyprus, redomicilization was a simple process. It was a five, six months process, but it was a pretty straight jacket process. Uh, approval of the registrar of companies was required, approval of the income tax department was required, further a three months public notice is required to be given. And after the expiry of this three months, the registrar of companies gives you the approval if no objections are received from the public at large. Further, the company took a call that the Mauritius entity, basically after redomicilization, re the entity in Mauritius, at that time, the concept of GBL1 and GBL2 was prevalent. So they maintained the GBL2 license because the intent was never to take any benefit under the TTA between India and Mauritius. So they did not go through the process of converting a GBL2 to GBL1, and they continued with GBL2. So this, this was one, uh, one case study that uh, I have done in the past, which I thought of sharing with you. Now, the bigger question arises is, in case of an inbound merger, the, the Income Tax Act clearly talks about that what would be the tax implications. But if you read through those sections, those sections cannot be made applicable to an outbound transaction. So for example, if there is a transfer of capital asset from the transferer to the transferee, that transfer would be tax neutral only as mentioned in 47.6, the amalgamated company is an Indian company. Similarly, when shareholders of the amalgamating company are issued shares of the amalgamated company, it's an exchange transaction, it is a transfer, but it is a tax neutral transaction subject to the condition that the amalgamated company as per 47.7 is an Indian entity. Similarly, in case of a demerger, the resulting company should be an Indian entity, then only the trans, then, then only there will be no capital gain on the transfer of assets from the demerged company to the resulting company. With respect to shareholders, there is no requirement that the resulting company should be a Indian entity. As far as carry forward of losses is concerned, there is no provision which says that the losses of an Indian entity can be carried forward by the foreign entity. And more so, this would depend also on the laws of the foreign country. It is not totally dependent on the Indian tax laws. Now, if I say inbound merger, will the losses of a foreign company be allowed to be carried forward by the Indian entity? If you read 72A, it says that only such losses of the transferer can, company can be transferred to the transferee company which if such restructuring had not happened, then the transferer company could have availed those losses. Now, if it is a foreign company, a foreign company cannot avail its losses in India. And therefore, we take a position that in case of a cross-border inbound merger, the losses of the foreign transferer company cannot be carried forward by the Indian entity. Move ahead. So this is these, these are some of the other ways beyond mergers and demergers where a cross-border transaction can be structured. A redomicilization is basically akin to a change in registered office of the entity. The, the tax situs of the company, the corporate situs of the company moves from an A country to B country. Now, this is possible only if both the transferer jurisdiction and the transferee jurisdiction permit this kind of a redomicilization. For example, as I gave you the example of Cyprus, a Cyprus entity moving to Mauritius, both Cyprus allowed that redomicilization and Mauritius was ready to accept a Cyprus entity. So it's shifting the company from one country to the other for the purpose of a restructuring. Liquidation is similar to an Indian liquidation where you wind up an entity. Deregistration in some countries, like we have off late explored a deregistration in Hong Kong, it is akin to a easy exit kind of a situation where you can quickly 
wind down the company with the approval of the registrar of companies. It's not a liquidation, it's not a winding up, it is more like a closure of the company under an easy exit kind of a scheme. A buyback or a capital reduction is again, they are just mechanism of upstreaming of funds. In countries like Mauritius, you even have the concept where you may not reduce the capital and you may just upstream your premium. So the capital stays intact and it's only premium which is kind of upstream to the parent entity. Thank you. From GAR perspective, it is very important to keep two, three things in mind. A, whatever we have spoken in the last 60 odd minutes, every structure, every corporate structuring exercise, every reorganization needs to be tested from general anti-avoidance rule perspective. India has come up with, uh, with their own GAR rules, effective 1st April 2017, and where the rule has been codified that in case any transaction which has been declared by income tax authority as an impermissible avoidance arrangement, then the authority may deny any benefit whatsoever the taxpayer would have brought in or would have got over a period of time due to this arrangement. Now, what is impermissible avoidance arrangement? It has been defined that any arrangement or a step of an arrangement which has been undertaken with a main purpose to obtain tax benefit and more importantly, which lacks or deemed to lack the commercial substance in whole or a part. Now, the section has been nicely drafted and it's tried to cover with a very wide range of any steps or the entire transaction which lacks the commercial rational. It does not prohibit any organization to undertake a capital uh, uh, restructuring or a corporate restructuring, all what one needs to keep in mind that when you create any restructuring plan or when, you, when an organization undertakes any sort of the activities, the commercial rational and commercial substance should be kept in mind. And if required, that needs to be substantiated with the authorities. If those commercial rational and commercial substance is not uh, to be established and if, if the SSC or the taxpayer fails to establish such commercial substance, then the tax authority may invoke the provision of general anti-avoidance rules and in that case they could possibly deny all the benefits and all the tax neutrality, carry forward of the losses, etc, etc, whatever we have spoken. And therefore nowadays whenever any organization undertakes a capital restructuring, GAR has to be kept in mind and the principle of GAR has to be kept in mind to avoid any sort of a future hassle. With this, we have practically come to the end of our session and we would be more than happy to uh, take up the questions which has come into Q&A sessions. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Amit and Suvira for the insightful session and sharing your practical experiences. We have received a couple of questions from the participants. Uh, I'll just read out the questions for you one by one in no particular order. So Absolutely. the first question relates to conversion of firm into company. Uh, so I'll address it to Suvira. Uh, Suvira, the question is, can the provisions of section 45 subsection 4 apply on conversion of firm into a company, considering the firm would stand dissolved? See, 45.4 is applicable either on dissolution or reconstitution of a firm. Okay, and what we are talking about is conversion of a company, conversion of a firm to a company. There is really no distribution happening to the partners. And the, the, the objective of 45.4 was to tax the partnership firm if there is a distribution happening to the partners. So I think so the answer is no, In 45.4 would not be applicable in case of a conversion. Okay. Uh, another question uh, which relates to, again, the conversion of firm into a company is whether a part of the current account in the partnership firm books prior to conversion be converted into a loan to the company by the partners pursuant to such conversion. This is a very general question which comes our, our way. So, uh, see, current account is like reserves. So there are ways and means of dealing with it. If I want to maintain current account as current account, then it will move to the reserves of the resulting company. If I want capital against it, then I'll have to convert current account into capital and then do the conversion. 
and if i want current account to stay as a loan then the tactic is basically you pay out the current account to the partners and let them reinvest it into the partnership firm as a loan so there is flexibility but all this structuring or the outcome which you want all that structuring will have to be done prior to the conversion because whatever is there at the time of conversion of the partnership firm it will go in the same format into the company as a process of conversion you can't change the nature of a current account to a loan account hope i've answered the question basically yeah so we move over to the next one uh, and that relates to carry forward of losses Uh, so amit the question is is it sufficient that the conditions of section 79 are satisfied with reference to the previous year in which the loss is incurred and the year in which the loss uh, the set off of such loss is claimed notwithstanding that in the intermediate period there is a change in the share holding uh, which may cross the permissible threshold and thus trigger limitation of section 79 uh, sure so be and this is again a very very common questions uh, there have been some judgment to say that what is important to meet is a year of set off and the year of loss and in case between both the years there is a change in shareholding and again that 51% threshold has been regained then the losses will allow to be set off but unfortunately there is only couple of judgments and if you read the sections uh, section 79 read with section 71 72 it talks about that the losses only allowed will be carry forward if they are eligible of being carry forward and section 79 again start with a not standing clause where it's override everything into the section or into that chapter to so keeping that in mind the better view of law is the moment section 79 get invoked where there is a change of share holding happening beyond 49% the loss will get lapsed and the moment the loss will get lapsed it cannot be allowed to be carry forward and then set off even in the year of set off there is a regain in the position and it's still that 51% being met as i mentioned there is couple of judgments supporting this view what the question has come uh, but they are very very litigative and therefore company should keep that in mind if they want to go with that line of thoughts okay fair enough uh, so the next question is more you know on the practical aspect of uh, mergers and demergers so this is for suvira uh, the question from the audience is have you practically worked on any cross border uh, merger or demerger and how do the regulatory authorities like the nclg or income tax they consider the cross border mergers as compared with a domestic merger transaction uh, see the process is the same in india for the for a cross border transaction Uh, you will require nclt approval rdol approval income tax approval all that is there the additional process is of course in the overseas jurisdiction and in my experience i have seen that uh, when you are approaching the indian nclt basically the tribunal they will want to understand that what is happening in the overseas jurisdiction and before the final order in one instance i could say i can say that in one instance before the nclt gave the final approval they wanted to see the order of the mauritius authorities so uh, they they don't they want to be sure that the process is running fine in the overseas jurisdiction also before the approval is granted in india other than that it goes parallel i mean in in india as well as in overseas jurisdictions you have to kind of time the transactions because india i have generally seen the timelines are longer than overseas jurisdiction so if i am doing a mauritius into india mauritius would take practically 2 months india would at least take 5 to 6 months so we start the mauritius process a bit late and uh, once we reach the last fag of the india uh, process then we start the mauritius process uh the next question again relates to section 79 so it states the startup has a certificate of eligible business from the interministerial board of certification however the turnover has exceeded 100 crores in a year now will the benefit of section 79 pursuant to a change in shareholding uh, still be available a clean answer for that is no because section 79 does not only give a 
a blanket exception to starter, but it links to the condition mentioned in the section 80 IAP, where it is mentioned that uh, uh, inter-ministerial board, uh, the board uh, approval, as well as the threshold of 100 crores. Therefore, both the threshold has to be seen for the purpose of being eligible for section 79. Otherwise, uh, section 79 will get invoked and you will not get into the exceptions of section 79 being in start. Okay. Uh, again, uh, we have another practical question, uh, whether the redomiciliation process is practically doable and do all the companies permit a redomiciliation? Companies or countries? Countries, sorry. Yeah, okay. I misread that. So, yeah. uh, so redomicilization I have done. As I said, it is more like a process, should be permitted by both the transfer and transferee, then only it is doable. Like if I give you an example, Singapore allows redomicilization, but only inbound redomicilization. So then you can't think of moving a Singapore entity somewhere else. So you have to be very careful where you are going for a redomicilization, and you have to check from both the transferer and the transferee jurisdictions. Otherwise, if it is permitted, my experience from Cyprus to Mauritius was pretty good. We were able to move it, I mean, within the time frame also. So I, I don't see a problem actually that way. So it's a good way of uh, structuring a transaction if that option is available, basically. Okay. So the next question, Amit, is can a loss making company, which is not continuing? Uh, that business, the company has started a new business and this loss pertains to the business which has been closed down. Now, can this loss making business be transferred through demerger to another company and the losses be set off in the resulting company? So before we take this, one of the condition of the demerger says that the undertaking which is getting transferred should be on a going concern. Now, if you, and, and then it says that if the entity getting transferred, then loss relating to the undertaking can only be carried forward. Now, in this fact, if the loss is pertaining to a closed down business, then you will not be able to transfer that business on a going concern. And in that case, loss relating to that particular undertaking will not be allowed to be carried forward. And if, even if it is a general loss, Amit, then also if the undertaking is not being transferred, how it. will you apply the formula also? Absolutely. The, and, and the second point is that going concern condition has to be met and therefore yeah. the post down con, uh, business loss cannot be carried forward. There are either other way of structuring it that if you undertake this prior to the date of closing down, transfer it and then undertake some sort of a closing down or ramping down over a period of time, you can still achieve the same achieved result but you need to plan in, in advance. Right. So then there is another question again relating to section 79. And the question is, uh, is the word manufacture of, uh, sorry, I think this relates to 72A probably, is the word manufacture of software also defined in the income tax law? Unfortunately not. And we see some sort of a discussion around it because the word manufacturing of computer software is very, very wide. And we know that software nowadays could be a tiny, small molecule as compared to a bigger ERP system. Therefore, on a case-to-case -case basis, one has to look at that. And more importantly, more than income tax act, one should see how the IP law and how the other laws in India are talking about, about them to be called as a manufacturing of computer software. Uh, to be precise, Income Tax Act is silent on that definition. Okay. Uh, so, think, so, yeah, sure. No, no, go ahead. You were saying? Okay, so there's another question in relation to conversion of firm into company, which states that can the benefit of a lower rate of tax uh, of 15% uh, under Section 115 BAB be undertaken uh, by the newly converted company? Difficult because how will you meet the 80-20 requirement? 80% has to be new plant and machinery. And what we are doing, we are just converting uh, a partnership into a company. So it's just a change of cloak. It's not as if it, it, it is kind of acquiring new assets. So I, I don't think so you will be able to get the 
tax rate. 22% of course, it is available to everybody. So uh, that will be available to the resulting company, but the 15% tax rate would not be available. Okay, sure. So another question again relates to a uh, conversion of firm into company and that's on the section 43, uh, sorry, sorry, section 47 itself. What it says is that the section states conversion of firm into company as a result of succession. So now in such a case, the firm is no longer in existence. Now, whether can this be classified as succession since the traditional understanding of succession involves two parties, transfer from one to another. So whether conversion can be regarded as succession? In fact, conversion, the favorable judgments, the TechSpin and even Umicore, when they are saying there is no transfer, one of the arguments is this only, that it is succession and it is vesting. So uh, the judiciary, to a certain extent, is of the view that it is succession and not a transfer and therefore should not be subject to capital gain. In fact, I see one of the questions which they have asked then why has why have the 4713 conditions been prescribed? I also ask myself the same question <laughs> that if it is not a transfer and if we are taking that position that it is not a transfer, then why did the legislature prescribe the 4713 conditions? And that time, that is why taking this call as to whether it is a transfer or not a transfer becomes critical. Because the moment you say that it is not a transfer, then there was no need for a 4713. So taking this aggressive position of that 4713 is not applicable, it is not a transfer, it should be a thought through kind of a call. Sure, sure. Another practical query relating to 72A, Amit. So what if the company cannot run the business of the entity which has been taken over for five years due to the reasons which are beyond the control of the company? Will the set of benefit uh, will be withdrawn or are there some provisions to approach the income tax authorities to allow the same? So typically, uh... Only one condition which has been mentioned with regard to that 50% install capacity, I mentioned about three conditions, one about in terms of five years carryover and 75%. Those two, there is nothing in the law which specifies. But with regard to the third condition, there is a, uh, there is a rule which has been given that if because of any other reason, the company believes that they will not be able to achieve that 50% in four years or five years, and then may take a longer time, they can make an application to the central government and central government may allow them to do it. But apart from that, there is nothing per se here and those conditions need to be met. If you are not able to meet those conditions, then the, the losses which has been set up uh, by the merged entity or the amalgamated entity will become taxable. Uh, overall, this is, we just want to make only a concluding remark is that corporate restructuring is very common within the corporate to structure and to see how the overall basis of optimization can be brought in. More importantly is one should look at it, them in advance, think through to the extent possible. I completely agree that Business is nowadays very dynamic. The changes, the uncertainty kind of comes on a very daily basis. Therefore, to the extent possible, plan your objective in advance, take your steps in advance, and then undertaking the kind of implementation of that. And if GAR provisions and business rationalists are there available in particular circumstances, corporate structuring is a very, very common way of looking at and bringing a, a, a business efficiency into it. Suvira, you want to add anything as a closing remarks? No, I would, I'll, I'll just say I'll echo you, Amit. I mean, actual proper planning is very important. Planning, you will have the flexibility of structuring the transaction correct. Once it's done, then kind of trying to do a forensic does not achieve much. Absolutely. So I, my exactly. suggestion would also be to do with do proper planning before implementing the transaction. Great. This, with this, we come to the end of the session. Thank you very much for joining. I'm sure you've, uh, you, you, you found it very useful, uh, but your feedback would be more important to us. And as Sridhar mentioned at the start of this, it is just a beginning of our series. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure we see most of you in, in actually the next session as well.